Witches, thank you for being here with me today. I'm Coach Carla, and today we are talking with Christian families, speaker, facilitator, lawyer, and entrepreneur. I met her as a lawyer. She has increased in stature. She has done some amazing things. She's had a TED Talk. We are going to talk about that. But before we get started, let's first welcome Christian family. Thank you so much for having me today. You're welcome. I'm so glad you could take the time out your schedule because I know you are in the glow up phase. Oh, listen. We're going to talk about your TED Talk later. Okay. But first, let's talk about how you got started. Well, this is actually a pretty cool story. It starts with... I was really introduced to divorce, I would dare say, at the age of seven by my parents. <laughs> but I didn't know that I was going to be a divorce lawyer mm -hmm. um, until I became one. Until you became a divorce lawyer? Yes. Or a divorced lawyer? Ha ha. A divorce lawyer. Uh -huh. My divorces actually came after the profession. Wow. Yeah, right? So the fun part about that story is really when I went to college, I wanted to be a math teacher. Okay. Because isn't that what everybody wants to do? No. Okay. No. So <laughs> at the small liberal arts college I went to the University of Rochester, I couldn't graduate in four years and get a degree and be a math teacher. I was going to have to get a four-year degree in math to stay for a fifth year and get a degree in teaching. Mm. Right? So right at the fourth semester of calculus, multidimensional analysis. Yeah. All of a sudden, I can no longer integrate or differentiate. You know, I can't think of more in three dimensions. You, you beat me. You beat me. Right? So I had to quit the math. <laughs> now it's like I've been in college for two years to be a math teacher. What you going to do? I ended up with a degree in English literature. Yeah. What does one do with a degree in English literature? Teach. No. Keep going to school. Keep what going to do with that? So. <laughs> You just keep going to school. You just keep going to school. Keep going to school. Cause I, I mean, it doesn't really qualify you for that much. a job. Right, right. So I wanted to be a social worker. So mm -hmm. I thought I was going to apply to social work school a case. My mother kind of was like, yeah, I don't know. You might, you might want to go with a social work and an MBA, a social work and a PhD, something that's not just right. a social work degree. Right. And I found that they had a dual degree, social work and law. Oh. And so I said, oh, mommy, what do you think about this? Because that's what you do when you grow up. Right? You check with your mother. She thought it was a great idea. Right. Incidentally, I applied to and was accepted into law school before the social work application was even due. So I decided I'd be a lawyer. The social work field has lost a great person. There you go. But the law field gained a great one. That's how it went down. And so as a law student, I started working at Legal Aid. Okay. And that's where I started working in the Family Law Division, Domestic Violence Division, working with victims of abuse, getting them divorces. Mm. And that's when I knew I had found my space. The divorce angle. Yes. But I've heard you. You are an advocate for marriage. Absolutely. A, a divorce attorney that is an advocate for marriage does not seem like that's putting a lot of money in her pocket, but guess what? It does. It is. <laughs> my question. Well, let me tell you. The key to this is, um, it's an analogy I use first, right. which kind of helps, right? Um, when people train bank tellers mm -hmm. on money, they don't train them on fake money. Right. They train them on real money. The question is, how do I know a real $100 bill when I see it? That's what you need to know. So when you see an authentic $100 bill, when you see a fake $100 bill, you know that that's not the real thing. Right. And to me, it's the same thing with marriages. Right. The point is, every marriage is not a bad one. Right. Every marriage is not right for divorce. Some marriages are literally a diamond. It is really a valuable thing. And you would be a fool to throw it away and treat it like glass just because it's a little dirty. Right. But at the same time, you'd be a fool to treat a marriage that really is glass like it was a diamond. Ooh. And then they're standing in front of you saying, I want a divorce, I want a divorce, I want a divorce. But you see that there are diamonds in the rough. Yes. How do you polish and shine? What do you suggest to them? What, do you, what are your first things that you do? Gotcha. So I can tell you, in my experience, good, healthy marriages don't end in divorce. Well, that makes sense. They don't. You don't just wake up one day and it's like, 
Everything is going great. I love you. This house is wonderful. My life is wonderful. Let's get a divorce. Let's get a divorce. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Even if you've heard someone say, hey, it's okay to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. right? Which is why I don't have to advocate for divorce. Right. Divorce is happen. Right. They happen. And sometimes they're the right thing to happen. It's not always a bad thing. But so someone comes to me and they're thinking about divorce. Because that's usually what's happening in this situation you're talking about, right? They're thinking about right. divorce. And my position is now, and always has been, no one should ever be thinking about divorce. They should not be thinking about divorce. You should what never should they be, be thinking doing? about? You should be doing one of two things. Getting a divorce or working on your marriage. That makes sense. <laughs> There's no reason to be thinking about divorce. People are usually thinking about divorce because they're doing one of two things. They are fantasizing about divorce. Ooh, when I get a divorce, these things are going to be so much better. Right. I won't have to deal with this. I won't have to do this. You know, and they're kind of fantasizing about this life, right. this divorce life that is somehow greener than what they're dealing with in their marriage. Right. And let me tell you, fantasy is not reality. They call it fantasy for a reason. Okay. Okay. And so that's the situation with that. And so if, if, we, uh, if I'm hearing that conversation from the person and I can tell what they're doing is fantasizing, mm -hmm. it's important to point out that divorce is really just trading one set of problems for another set right. of problems. It's a choice you're making. Right. What's the opportunity that I see in this marriage? What's the opportunity that I see in this divorce? Right. What's going on? What is it that I'm really trying to do? What is it that I want? And some people think... And, you know, celebrities, we've seen it. It's just an opportunity to roll through. They, I, oh, I'm married Friday. I'm divorced on Saturday. I, it's just, it was just a weekend thing. Or I've been married for 73 days or however long that young lady was married. And reality says there, there, there has to be some work involved. Mm -hmm. Now, you've talked to them. They realize, hey, I, I, I'm good. We're going to work on it. But you also talk to them and they realize, no, we're out of here. Right. What do you do? Ah, now these people have sometimes the reason that they were thinking about divorce and maybe afraid to do it is because they were fatalizing. That's the word I made up. Fatalizing. Fatalizing divorce. Oh my God, if I get divorced, everything mm. is going to crash around me. Right. I'm going to lose, lose, lose. I'm going to lose my husband. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose my house, lose my kids, lose my money. Lose, 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 lose. And that's fatalizing. And that's sometimes what keeps people in marriages that aren't serving them. Right. right? They're so afraid. But for those folks, I'm able to show them that divorce is really an opportunity. Mm. It's an opportunity to create something new. It's an opportunity to have the things that you want that you cannot have inside of the marriage. Right. Right. And as they're fatalizing, does that call them... They're, they're fatalizing because they call them to be paralyzed mm -hmm. and just starting to hang on. And, I, you know, you hear of stories about people just, you know, they're dead, but they haven't been buried. Correct. Are there marriages like that? Mm -hmm. Listen, I was at one. Tell us about your marriage. No, yes, you said you are, you, you are a divorce attorney, then you became divorced. Yeah, twice. 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 Twice divorced. Twice divorced. Twice divorced. So, in thinking about the second marriage, I went into that one, so I guess this set the story up. My second marriage was seven years in total. There were three kids inside of that marriage. And you get to hear part of the story in the TED Talk. <laughs> it was moving really fast, that marriage. I was pregnant really quick in, and it looked like all the things that I had wanted it to be. Emphasis on look like. Look like, exactly. And it could have been and should have, but it wasn't. Inside of that marriage, I was being disrespected, mistreated, and I was shutting down. Mm -hmm. But I was so busy trying to not be divorced, to keep up the airs, to avoid the shame and the guilt and the judgment that comes with being divorced, right. that I was becoming a zombie inside of that marriage. And it hadn't even reached the apocalypse yet. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It was hard to see, really. I had lost so much this connection with myself. I wasn't even looking at myself in the mirror. I wasn't even seeing myself directly looking myself in the eyes. I had lost all, even respect for myself and being in a situation where I was allowing myself to be disrespected that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. 
And when it finally came to me that what I wanted right, was peace of mind, was to live. Right. And that I couldn't have it inside that marriage. That's when divorce was the thing that made sense. But as long as I was willing to sacrifice myself and die, trying to keep up an image, trying to save his life, trying to do whatever it is I thought I was doing in that marriage. Whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it was. But it wasn't until my life was more important, that wanting to live was more important, that I made the decision to get out. That sounds like you had to make a decision. This happiness or this happiness. And this happiness, everybody was happy except you. Which then was really causing stuff to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And this happiness, other people were miserable, but you were happy, which was creating more happiness for other people that needed to have you, namely the children. Yes. What would you tell someone that's sitting, looking at both of these options? Mm -hmm. What would be the first thing that you would tell them? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Mm -hmm. And when you determine that, because that's the real question. Right. Because too often, at least me personally, was focused on what I didn't want. Right. Didn't want to be a single mom. Didn't want to be divorced. Didn't want to be judged. Right. And I think a lot of people, that, that's their perspective. When you think about affirmations and the universe and you know bringing things into perspective they tell you over and over again whatever you think about and focus on is what you're going to get so if you're focusing on not being a single mom you're going to be a single mom if you're focusing on not being divorced you're going to be divorced because you're not focusing on staying divorced staying in a healthy marriage creating a healthy marriage you're focusing on these things that you don't want right. and Everything that you focus on that you don't want, that's what you get. Then you said you are was introduced to divorce at the age of seven. What does that mean? Huh. My parents divorced when I was seven. Okay, so you're a child of a divorce. I am a child of divorce, an adult child of divorce now. An adult child of divorce. Okay, and most children of divorce, just in my experience, never want to be divorced. Right. It's a big thing. It happened to you, it hurt. I felt like my family was broken. I've always wanted both of my parents to be back together. Right. Always. From seven years old, I'm 43. <laughs> I always wanted them to get back together. Right. I didn't want to do that to my kids. How do you think being in a, in a marriage that where the, the wife is disrespected or the husband, it, it could go either way, it's disrespected, affects the children? Mm. In my house, I know that the kids were having a hard time sleeping. Mm. Because you never knew when you're gonna start hearing things break and crash and yelling, mm -hmm. and it was definitely it was disturbing their sleep. It was making them anxious uh, like that. It also started to make them a little clingy. Mm -hmm. I could tell, wanting to know where I was, where he was, you know, just to try to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. My oldest daughter, and she's only seven now. Seven, but it affected her. So she really felt like it was her fault mm. because she wasn't praying hard enough. And you hear so many stories about the children thinking it is their fault. Now, you were a child of divorced parents. Mm -hmm. So that's your parents divorced and then you divorced twice. So that's three divorces? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, oh no, even better than that. Actually, my mother's divorced twice, my father's divorced three times, I'm divorced twice. We got seven divorces between us. Wow. And sometimes seven is not a lucky number. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this may be one of those times. Seven divorces between the three of you. Yep. What have you all learned? Mm -hmm. Especially, what have you learned? Beautiful. What I have learned is that divorce is not a villain. Okay. It's not a hero, necessarily. That's good to know, too. But it's not a villain. Divorce really is an opportunity. It's the result of everything that happened leading up to it. Mm -hmm. And then it's an opportunity to create new things afterwards. Because there is an afterwards. There is an afterwards. And with every opportunity, that's the nature of an opportunity. You can use it or you can waste it. 
You can use it or you can waste it. And you have been using your opportunities like crazy. You have become involved with this program called Next Level. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about what that program is? Oh my gosh, listen. Next Level Emotional Intelligence Leadership Training. It's here in Columbus, Ohio. This is, this is going to be local, right? It's local and across the country. Local and across the country. So there's the next level here in Columbus. They actually also have one in Philadelphia. Um, and there are like sister facilities in other places. Um, California, they're opening one in Boston. There's a bunch of gratitude uh, centers in Florida, just in case anybody's interested in this kind of training. Yes. So appreciate this story. How much time do I have? Keep going. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was originally introduced to uh, the Next Level Emotional Intelligence Training in April of 2015. Okay. At that time, I had just joined this law firm coaching group, right? Because I also owned a law firm, Christian Family Law. And it was teaching me mindset and, you know, how to grow mm. and that kind of thing. And so I was like, well, I don't need that next level. I have me a mindset community. I don't need that community. Right. right? Of course, three years into working on my business, and it has been growing. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong with a lot, right? But it still wasn't growing, and I wasn't having the kind of success I felt like I should be having, right? And so finally, I was like, you know what? I am going to go to that training because clearly the only thing holding me back is me, right? This has got to be some kind of limiting belief, some something that's going on with me that's hindering my success. So sometime in like February of 2018, I signed up to take the class in August, August 3rd through the 5th. The 5th was incidentally my 42nd birthday, oh. right? So I signed up for that weekend. I was like, oh. I'll how precious is that? Right? So did you get me right? So there you go. In May of 2018, I was at a workshop with my law firm community, and the idea there was to open up a second law firm. I was thinking of going into real estate, maybe a title agency, you don't know. But at that workshop, we realized that that was a bad idea mm. because my current law firm at the time, Manning Law Company, was not really running that well. I had just fired the associate, the paralegal had just quit. It's the, yeah, you're not in a position to open no. a new one. In fact, your new one really ought to be your old one started over back. <laughs> and so, on that note, we were talking and it was like, and what's with this name of the law firm, Manning Law Company? What do you even do? How do we know what that is? Aren't you like Christian divorce law or Christian family law? I said, yeah. As a matter of fact, I am Christian family law. But in Ohio, they don't allow trade names. On law oh, firms. okay. The law firm has to be named after you. Oh. So the only way that my law firm could be Christian Family Law was if my name was Christian Family. Okay. Ah, which is how that happens, right? Because people say, is that your name? Yes, it is. Chose it for myself, right? Right. So <laughs> made that decision in May of 2018. Okay. It was a little tongue-in-cheek at the time, right? But I am. I'm going to change my name to go so I can change the name of the law firm. The name change hearing, incidentally, was August the 2nd. There was no way to plan that. No. The day before going into my next level training. August the 2nd, which was awesome because I got to really immerse myself in my name. So I spent three days with a name tag on with people who never knew me before calling me Christian. Right. Right. Way to learn your new name. So the timing on that was awesome. What I didn't know was that on August the 1st, my husband would punch me in the face and block my eye. Ooh. Okay, so August the 1st, black eye. August the 2nd, new name. August the 3rd through the 5th, I'm in the next level training. While in the training, there's a sign on the wall the whole time that says, what are you pretending not to know? Oh my goodness. I was pretending not to know I was in an abusive marriage. Mm. The reason my business was not growing is because my message is that Christian women don't have to stay in bad marriages. But? But here I am, a Christian woman who felt trapped in what was clearly a bad marriage. Clearly. That's what was hindering my success. That was hindering me. Mm -hmm. And so there we are. Next level helps me to see. And, and God used, and I always say that, God used next level to help me to see that the marriage I was in was not serving me. And so when you said you was getting disrespected and seven years in, had you not seen that, how long would you have been there? It's scary. It's scary to think about. Mm -hmm. 
That's scary to think about it because I honestly don't know because I was getting so further into it, so deep into it, so into the darkness of it. And the Bible talks about that. You know, at some point your darkness seems like light. You know, you're there, you're so into mm -hmm. it. And the shame. I didn't want anybody to know what was going on inside that marriage. Well, they got a put the black eye. Somebody knew something. You can only run into so many doors, Christian. I know. I know. I know. I know. Now, next level, mm -hmm. you're divorced. Mm -hmm. What else did you do? Wow. So, next level was beautiful about that train. Excuse me, out here. Is that it has uh, multiple levels. Okay. So, as much as I'm now aware that I'm in this abusive marriage, I didn't have a plan to get out of it. I just knew I was in it. Just, <laughs> no, I just knew I was in it. Okay, um, I know I'm in it. Okay, thank you. Have a nice day. Right? And so what's cool about the program is that, so step one, they call it discovery. Right. What, what's holding me back? And what, did you, and what did you discover? And I discovered what was holding me back was I was in that marriage. Right. I was, so I was not authentically being myself. Then step two, they call it breakthrough. It was three weeks later. And here's an opportunity to break through whatever those limiting beliefs are, whatever it is that's holding me back. I knew I needed to continue into the training. The Wednesday night before that training, I felt him starting to fight with me. Mm. And I'm, before the breakthrough? Before the breakthrough training. Okay. Now, I'm feeling myself all empowered. I had these new tools, right, I learned from Discovery. So he coming at me, right, I'm dodging him. You know what I mean? I'm in the matrix. I see you, I see you trying. I ain't even fucking all right. I ain't even right. fucking all right. Ain't all right. Ain't all right. Ain't okay, okay, so I'm feeling like I'm, I'm on top of this. But he's no different. Right. And I can see it just as clear. Me huddled in the bed, holding my two little boys. And him cussing and throwing and threatening and, I mean, spitting and just like, really? Right? And saying to him, you're going to still be mad about this tomorrow. You don't have to do this right now in front of these kids like this. This, this mm -hmm. doesn't have to be like this. He kept doing things to try to get a row out of me. But I wouldn't, mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't engage. I was different. He finally picked the baby up and left with the baby. And anybody that is a mother knows. Not the baby. Not the baby. That's the instinct, right? That was going to be the thing that made me move. But I stopped and I breathed and I said, look, God, if he kills that baby, that's on him. And it was a hard thing to have to think, but what was I going to do right. by jumping up and checking? What was, what was going to happen? Right. Right. So ultimately, he did pass out holding the baby. The baby lived. I can attest to that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, but it was like, yeah, I got to get out of this. So I still didn't have a plan. Still no plan. Still no plan. Still so you, no got plan. Break, you got the break. You had the breakthrough. Right. So Thursday, uh, I go to the training. That's the next day, right? Thursday night, I get in late. I don't want to talk to him. I sleep upstairs away. Friday, same kind of thing. I don't see him. I don't want to talk to him. Finally, I say, listen, I'll talk to you on Saturday in the morning before I go. I knew he wanted to still talk about what we was fighting about on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and sure enough, he did. Peeking in the shower on me. You remember? I, really? Are we still on this? <laughs> it's now Thursday and Friday. It's three days later. Three I, days haven't, later. I haven't spoken to you in 72 hours. And we still talking about the same thing? Right. And then he opened up the door. He said, what? You want a divorce? Yes! <laughs> it couldn't get any plainer. <laughs> it couldn't get any plainer. But I, because I was really finally living my truth. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was so busy wanting to not be divorced. Right. If he would say that, it would make me say, oh, no, baby, no, no. We're going to make this work. Right. Right. And so... The breakthrough gave me the courage to kind of be myself and speak, speak my truth. And so I finished that part of the training. Amen. Then they had a third part of the training, uh, right? Which we call, right? VIP, which is your Vision Impact Program. And I knew I was going to need that program, which was like really three months, because I was going to need the support. Right. This was a major transition. Right. And I did it, and it was awesome. And being the overachiever that I am. Overachiever. I know her. Overachiever. Overachiever. They have a fourth part of the program, which is FIT, Facilitator and Transformation Training. 
And it was a six month process. Mm -hmm. I went into it and it was a beautiful day because the day, in fact, that I was officially divorced, I was going into one of my sessions with my community. It's the safest place I could possibly be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Thank you, Next Level. And <laughs> it was just, it was, it was a beautiful and a safe place to be. And it also helped me to strengthen and better my speaking skills, which I've already had. Right. And it helped me to be able to spot new opportunities when they came along. And so this time, so even though for seven years, as long as I've been in that relationship, I've been threatening to do a TED Talk. Threats! When it came through that they were doing live auditions, I went. We went. We went together. Because people with the information will always share the information. That's the truth. You can really write that down somewhere. Yeah. And how I went and I uh, shared about divorce. And I had an opportunity to present a TED Talk. Tell us. Uh, so now we're at the TED Talk moment. Because if you don't understand what TED Talk is, mm -hmm. let's find out a little bit about Tell us what TED Talk is. Ooh. So TED stands for Technology, I want to say Entertainment and Design. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that. We'll get it right. Right. <laughs> Technology, entertainment, design, but it's the idea that their ideas worth spreading. Mm -hmm. So it's just an opportunity for people who are subject matter, matter experts and whatever they're a subject matter expert on. In the area of expertise. Thank you very much. Um, to give a succinct talk of sorts on a particular topic, there is Big Ted. Which Big Ted. People hear about and Usually, you hear like those are really kind of famous people presented those. And then there are a lot of independently organized TED events, and those are TEDx. And so there's three individual ones here in Columbus. There's TEDx Columbus, there's TEDx Columbus Women's, which is coming up December the 4th. Mm -hmm. And there was the TEDx King Lake in Bronzeville, and I was in the TEDx Columbus. Okay, so what was your topic? Rethinking Divorce. Why did I know that? Why? Of course. Of course. What? Do you mean rethinking divorce? It's uh, it goes back to that about divorce is not this family destroying monster to be avoided mm -hmm. because that's who it was to me having been introduced to it at seven. Right. This thing to avoid. Right. And thinking about it that way had me in two marriages that didn't serve me. Okay, well, we heard about the first one. What? I mean, the second one, there was a first one? There was a first one. Tell us what happened with the first one. Girl, that story is too big. I don't know. You want that one too? Just give me a little bit. Okay, I get a little bit. Please join us next week as we continue our conversation with Christian Family, speaker, facilitator, entrepreneur, and lawyer.